evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Tonight you're going to experience some beautiful dances and a beautiful story. And all together, it's, it's like the city of Mandra always puts on a good show, and uh, we're going to help them make it be a success. And I don't know how far you come tonight, and I'm sorry I'm sitting down talking to you, but I've got a crook leg. That's my excuse tonight. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, like I said before, we're celebrating, like we always do in Mandra, we celebrate. Anything and everything. And man was getting very famous for this because um, you, just about every week there's something to celebrate. And uh, one of the things I've got to hang my head for a minute uh, just to remember those that have gone before us and also about a dear little boy who uh, lost his life a couple of days ago. And it's all over the papers today. That this little fellow, close to Christmas, lost his life because he wanted out of his home. And uh, they found him, but it was too late. So, when you're out there and you've got a big mob of kids, and that, uh, remember these people, the suffering that they're going through at the moment. And remember that you who have who've got children here and grandchildren, always look after them. Do your very best. And uh, tonight, we're going to celebrate Christmas. It's gonna, in the old days, our Christmas decorations were the Christmas tree with flowers with the big and hang around in our camps. But we were always happy. And if we had butter on the table, or if we had jelly and custard on the table at Christmas time, that was really something for our family. At times we used to have to starve if, we did, if our parents didn't find work. But we kept together. We always, I suppose, the love in our family kept us going. And our life has been a hard one. But today, we, in a city that's helping us to heal our wounds and the things that we used to carry with us, we always carried a lot of hatred around. We say, white men did us to us. White men did that to us. But today we work with white men. And we're all in it together. The healing process is starting to work. And tonight, with these beautiful kids here to put on a performance for you, and with our elder dancers here, we're going to, they're all my family, by the way, and I got half my family out there. And I want to say hello to you all. But, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much. You've been a very patient crowd out there, but um, it'll be worth it. Mm -hmm. So once again, I want to say welcome, because this is my country, and thank you very much. Now, I'll hand it over to George. George is my nephew, and they're going to say something in Noongar, because I refuse to learn that language. <laughs> It's a wonderful story that we, it will unfold before your eyes and it's a story that we all share and this, this most amazing person, a champion for the, the bushland and his name is David Rennie and we, we pay respect to our brother there because he's also spent time with our elders and Uncle, uh, Uncle Harry's uh, brothers and cousins as well. So. We, we acknowledge that and we respect that because he is another champion for the things that we hold dear to us and that is how do we look after this land? How do we look after the waterways? And one of the things that these little fellows down there, the little kids, um, and it's such an amazing story. Um, very sad to hear that little kid you know, drowned in the water. And this, this is a story to do with that that I was going to tell, so, you know, how things uh, come together, it's, it makes my hair stand up a little bit. 
kata kulanga mau kulanga ni ja ni 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 mo ni mo ka karija ni ja wanga children over here you listen to the story it's about the wobbles whiskers and the wobbles whiskers comes from the creation story in that spirit and the creation story tells us about the wobble that great serpent who came from the Avon river the male and female came down and created those rivers there and it came down and one went north and one went south and the one that came south the female created all our waterways here come in from the ocean and created the waterways that you see around you the estuary went up into the rivers and the creeks the lakes and the swamps and when it went to lake clifton you know them as the thrombolites we know them as the wobbles eggs of the wobble nor And so the story of how you relate a creation story down to practical stories for the kulanga goes into the having a moral to that story. And this story is about the wobbles whiskers that you can see on the side on this side. And we didn't talk about this and set it up no to know on that side there there's reeds all the reeds along the waterway that's the wobbles whiskers and those wobble whiskers is there as a little home it is a home for the frogs the kuya or some other mobs like kumula and the kuya will make that noise that the kuya makes and the kuya He got one other fellow there or maybe a few that will try and eat him. And that's the snake. That could be the you know the 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 tiger snake, the yorn. It could be the dugaits looking there, it could be the other carp snake coming along. But they're always looking for food. And so the wobbles whiskers, and this is a story for you to tell your little ones. Whether it's your children or your grandchildren. We say to our kids, don't you don't need the wobble's whiskers. Because the wobble might get you. But it's really a story to say to little kids, don't go near the water. Because you might drown there. Or you might get bitten by a snake. Or you might fall over and hurt yourself. and we connect those stories that we tell children from like i said the practical common sense way that goes right back to the creation stories because they are important and so when there's little mobia anywhere near the water you got to be very careful whether the wobbles whiskers are there or whether the wobbles whiskers are not there you got to be very careful Kaya? Kaya. 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 And that's the story of the Wobbles Whiskers. And we tell that story. It is a story for everyone. From the teacher of that to the learner of that. So thank you. Good evening. Sing a uh, welcome song.
is forever a vibration in the ground. It's called Shiva. Welcome the tears from all those ladies and gentlemen. Is that for Peggy? I love my wetlands. I love Mandra. I love the people. Tonight we've got them all together. We've got everyone that Matt is sitting in this room, believe it or not. Everyone that's here tonight needs to hear what's being said. Everyone here tonight needs to see what's just happened, what's going to come. 
I believe one person can make a difference and maybe there's a bit of proof that that is possible. I can't change the world, I can't fix the wetlands on my own, but I can maybe make those people that need to know and maybe I can touch people that can help and one becomes two and two becomes four and so on and so on and so on. Why do I love my wetlands so much? Obviously the birds. Hey, I went out there and photographed them and most of them know I got pretty good at that. Um, they're an amazing group of birds out there. Um, tonight though, I'm actually going to do something that's very unusual for me and I'm going to put the birds to one side. Tonight's not about the birds. Doing what I did and starting to understand what I started to understand about our wetlands came as quite a shock to me that our wetlands are not just about the birds, because originally that's what I thought it was all. I thought it was about the birds. Everything was to do with the birds. But I learned that it actually isn't. You're going to hear tonight, did you know? And you're going to hear tonight together we can make a difference. So here's my first, did you know? Did you know, or do you know, what a wetland actually is for? I thought it was for the wildlife and the birds. I thought the importance of a wetland was that we can get to go out and see some of the most magnificent birds and wildlife possible, and it is. It's critically important. But someone created it that way so we would be focused on it, so we would actually go out and go, wow, how beautiful is this? The sun rises, the sun sets, and in between, there is more beauty in those wetlands than you'll see anywhere else in the world, in any other part of the world. But they're more important than just for the birds. Before I came this morning, I was on the internet and I was actually 20 minutes late because I was reading something that was sent to me. And uh, in the United Nations, some very, very respected scientist and, and environmentalist has got up and said, <clears throat> forget about the atomic bomb, forget about wars, forget about famine. If we deplete any more of our wetlands, humanity will actually be in trouble. And uh, that's a big statement to make, but um, I'm going to now tell you a little bit about our wetlands and why they're so important. And it's important that you know that, that we're not out here just fighting for the birds. I mean, I wish it was just for the birds. Um, but I can guarantee in this room tonight, there's a lot of people here that are concerned about the birds and have come because of the birds. And a lot of you have come because you've been dragged along. Um, I'm hoping by the end of this night that whatever your opinions are of wetlands, you will actually realise that those wetlands are important for every person here and every person on earth. Um, I was going to bring the shovel and I did ask George to bring a spear because I was going to have some digs and some jabs. But I don't really believe there's anyone in this audience that needs a dig or a jab. Um, I can't see Greg Hunt, the Environmental Minister. Um, I can't see any of the environmental ministers here tonight. I can't actually see any minister here tonight that can help us in any way, shape or form, so I thought I'd better leave the shovel and the spear behind. Um, but I was going to have the digs and the jabs, but folks, we need you to understand what we are fighting for, and I'll guarantee you that you will actually want to help us fight, because we are fighting for us, our children, our children's 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 children. We can go 20, 30, 50, 80,000 generations ahead. We're actually fighting for their existence. We're fighting for them to be able to see, drink, eat, everything that we have. People that were just out here now, the Aboriginal people, were custodians of this land. I'm gonna use that word a lot too, custodians. Custodian means that we were the carers for. We are meant to care for and give back in better condition. When they were born into and onto the land, and I hope you got that, into and onto the land, Their belief, their way of life was that whatever they did, how would it affect 20 generations? Now please understand what I'm going to say, and I, and I know that George will smack me for this, but we believed them to be, when we first came here, a pretty ignorant, dumb people. 20 generations, what they did today, how would it affect 20 generations? You know what we work on tomorrow? If we do something now, how is it going to affect tomorrow? I mean it, we are a tomorrow society. Let's go dig a hole over there. Well, what's it going to be like three weeks now? Who cares? It's not going to be a problem tomorrow. And that's why we're in the trouble we're in. What is a wetland? What does a wetland do? What does it do for us? 
You can pick up any newspaper, you can look at the news any day of the week, and I guarantee you, you will see flooding, 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 flooding all around the world. If you do a little search, flood versus wetlands on your internet, you'll be amazed. Floods are increasing at a rapid exponential rate. In the last 100 years, that's right, the Aboriginal people have had this land for 40,000, we only took 100. In the last 100 years worldwide, we have depleted over 52% of all the wetlands in the world. 52%, that's half. We go another 100 years, that means there'll only be 25% left, another 100 years there'll be 12.5. The man who stood up at the United Nations said the critical point for us in this world is 40%. So that means somewhere in the next 50 years, guys? We're in trouble. That is our children. We're now talking our children are going to be in trouble for what we have done. And please understand, it's what we have done. We have allowed this to happen. We have allowed our wetlands to be degraded. Why is it so important? Worst, worst case scenario, a wetland, if you live by a wetland, a wetland is the most incredible defence mechanism against flooding. If you can imagine the wacky ground, uh, if you can imagine any football oval, because we all understand football ovals, if you could put six feet of water on top of that football oval, that's what wetlands can actually hold underground. That much water. When the rivers flood, it's funny how they're all by sort of water, isn't it, wetlands? Anyone ever sort of really stop and think about that? We only have wetlands by water. So when the river floods, the whole idea of a wetland is that the wetland will soak the water in and slow down its progress. And eventually it will stop it from getting to where we live, unless we build too close. Or unless we drain it. New Zealand has drained 90% of its wetlands for farming country. That's why we've got fantastic milk and great cheese. But I would not like to live in New Zealand when Noah comes back. Because they'll be in big trouble. 90% of their wetlands have been depleted, gone. They have drained them so they can put houses on, they have drowned so they can grow cows, so they can farm the land. Well, guys, I'll tell you the truth now. 40,000 years ago, Aboriginal people farmed this land. You might not realise that, but they farmed it. Fellow, they came, they left that alone, they walked away from that, they came back 10 years later, 5 years later, they burnt before they left, they farmed the land. We've been farming the land in New Zealand for, what it is, a couple hundred years? 90%. Now we can go through every country, I can give you the statistics of every country, but you're not here to hear about statistics. Um, but worldwide, 52%. Now, of course, then we come to Australia. Now, how good are we? Between, let's talk global, between Perth and Mandra, have a guess at the percentage that we have drained, destroyed and taken away of our wetlands. 80% of our wetlands. We live on a pretty low lying area. So when it rains and it floods, because one day it probably will, um, we don't have our wetlands now to actually help with the water being dispersed and stopped. Now you see my t-shirt? You've all seen it, and you'll see lots of people wearing it. Ramsar 482. Ramsar's a little town in Iran. So what's that mean to us? It's a long way away. They had a meeting there, 1975, 6, and they got a group of um, you know, people from all around the world that thought that it might be important to actually preserve some of these wetlands. God, that was 1975? 1975. I say that, 75, that's 30, 40 years ago. And they decided that it was important for the migratory birds, for the birds that flew now, you're ready for this, guys, all around the world. Do you believe that? There's birds that actually fly the whole length of the world. I think it's 26,000, someone correct me, 26,000 miles around the world in the circumference. Do you know there's a little bird that flies 13,000 miles one way and then 13,000 miles, that's 26,000 miles. It flies every single year. 26,000 miles. <laughs> it technically goes around the whole world. Poor little bugger's got to stop every now and then and have a feed. And where does he stop? He stops at significant wetlands around the world where the food that he needs to make him healthy and make him strong to be able to get to the next place where he can feed up is there. So let's drain the wetlands. And now I'm back on the birds I know, but let's drain the wetlands so that these little guys here that fly in have got nowhere to eat. And of course when that happens, unfortunately, um, there's another one that goes on the extinct list. They're beautiful. If we look at them in no other way, they're the most beautiful thing you'll ever see, the waterways and the wetlands. So we got Ramsar 482 protection, 25 odd thousand hectares of our waterways are protected by an international treaty. That is a treaty that's been signed internationally that we will protect them. When I was approached by Peel Harvey Cashman Council to see whether I would consider helping them 
um, because my photography might have helped and I jumped at it. I then found out, of course, that the Peel Harvey Cashman Council are the only body we've got here that have anything to do with our Rams R482. And I thought, you beauty, because I've got questions to ask as to why we can do that. I read the Act of Rams R482 and you can't do this, you can't do that, but we're doing it. And the saddest thing is that our government, our federal government, have never ever signed it into power. They have never made it law that our Rams are 482, or Rams are anyone in Australia, sorry, let me start again, Rams are of any of our 35, oh, Jane, how many have we got? 63, we have 63 Rams are protected sites in Australia, none of them the federal government have signed into power to make it so. They have not signed it so that the Rams are protection exists. But for 42 years or whatever it is, they've been trying to work out how to do it. Um, I, I, no, I, I just can't get my head around that. They're either significant and important or they're not. Um, but apparently they're not, but they are because we proudly wear this. Um, so we have this protection on these beautiful wetlands. And I'm sorry, it means squat. It means that a local government can make a decision and if they can sneak it through, it's snuck through and then, you know, it might go to the state government and they can sneak it through and it might get to the federal government and then it becomes point grey and somehow it still gets through. Um, so I understand my anger for all this is, is that we are meant to be protected here in Nandra. Our beautiful waterways are meant to be protected and it is a protection for the birds. So let's work on that. If it is for the birds and we can protect the birds, that means we're protecting us. Because remember what wetlands are for. Number one, they are floodplains. They stop everything from flooding. Pip, tell me what you saw out in the wetlands while you were out there doing what you do. natural environment can bring inspiration in many ways, whether it's the birds or the trees or other parts of, of nature, especially around Nantra. Forest strength. Standing tall in peace and unity, ever reaching to a higher goal. Straight and unwavering. They attain the greatest heights, offering shelter, fruits and beauty to all who pass that way. Each individual holds firmly, creating one majestic forest. Look up and be surrounded with their strength. Ladies and gentlemen, we put this together tonight because people seem to have a love of art, whether it be, you know, photography or painting, poems, dancing. There seems to be a way that we can touch people with our art. And in a way, we're all artisans, we're all artists. So what we've actually done, without probably realising it, is we've been able to do something that can now get to people to make them hear and see. Pip's talking about the beautiful forests and all that around our wetlands, which are depleting extremely fast. Understand, they're, 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 they're being depleted as fast as anything else. And I know that Anne-Marie also was out there. And Anne-Marie, what did you see? I saw Tewitt's dying, and I wrote an elegy for a Tewitt, for one tree, under bark that once made bowl and shield, Hollows which cradle red-tailed cockatoos now host feral bees, invading swarms that fill your empty heart, while lichen marks your lips saffron for burial, Tewitt. Stripped of your crown, your highest branches bare, sinuous body that once drank light, beggared now borrows from darkness. Stars for eyes, grows down into the land you rose from. Learning to let go of drying limbs, you've grown. Earth lends you other voices, singing long-necked turtles, 
moist requiems of sucker-fingered hyalid frogs. The ringtail possums cling as if they knew we were losing you, Stuart, where you fork and bend. Tangled dodder strings keen in this rising wind that taps your dead timbers together like clapping. inspires people in more ways than we can imagine. And what we're hoping is that it'll inspire mum and dad, it'll inspire children to want to retain and keep and to have this incredible system that we have out there for as long as we can possibly have it. Guys, when I grew up, you know, I was a pretty lucky bloke in a way. As a tacker, I grew up on a station, so I had plenty of land around me. Um, grew up on a farm, 32,000 acres, had plenty of land. Then we moved up to town, up to Perth. Had a backyard, a tenth of the size of this. There was nothing to climb. So the only backyard I could find was the backyard out in the bush. Now, the incredible thing is that today we live in houses with smaller blocks, but they're pretty close to the water because we seem to like to live by the water. So your backyard is actually that waterway out there. That's your playground. That's yours to love and enjoy and to own and to have ownership in. Um, it doesn't belong to one person. It doesn't belong to one group of people. It actually belongs to us all. It belongs to each and every mob that lives here that is part of it. Yet we tend to want to... build close. We tend to want to have grass that we've got to fertilise in certain ways. I just, I just got to the point of, of being gutted, of going out and seeing in such a short period of time how bad this got. And what I'm showing you at the moment is it's beauty, because there is beauty there if you look hard enough, and there is beauty there if we can manage it and slow it down and stop its degradation. It hit home for me one day when I went out and I had waders on and a heap of gear. I told the story a few times before, but I sunk up to here in this black ooze. That's why I carry that little thing there. I had cut the waders off. I had to leave a fair bit behind to actually get out of the black ooze. The tide was actually moving up and down at the time, so I, off memory it was going up. And I actually because, you know, I, I see things and think things a little bit different to everyone else. I could just imagine a helicopter coming along and all I saw was his hand with a camera. I honestly, at that time, was in fear that I wouldn't get out of this, this, this mud. It was like, it was horrible. But I managed to get out of it. Now, I'd walked there three years earlier and I'd walked across this waterway, rock hard. Three years is all it took. In that three year period, it went from being beautiful, pristine, into starting to become stinky and horrible and black and oozy and yucky. And I just got to the point where I thought enough was enough. Now guys, out there, every day, are the critters and the bugs and everything that live there. Now it is their, it is their home, it is their land, it's, it, it's where they live. Now I can tell you now, they're fighting every moment of their existence to survive out there. They're fighting each other for what food's left there. They don't need us to come along and make life harder for them. Um, it, it is an absolute dog-eat-dog -dog world in nature. It is, it is the strongest survive. Um, and, I, and I mean, nature's done that for a logical reason. The strongest trees will grow. Um, the strongest seed will become a tree. So that be, because it takes so long for trees to grow, it takes so long for a lot of the animals and the birds to reach maturity. I'm sure as you've walked along the waterways, you've seen these little birds here. They're called red-legged stilts. Cute little bird, can't you be? The actual bird itself is that, got big long legs, like that. Before I show the next photo though, I need a volunteer from the audience. So I asked the girls to actually um, pick someone out of the um, computer system for me to make it easier. And I'm needing Amanda Wilmont to stand up. She's in about row, maybe G17 or something like that. Don't try and 
Or Amanda, trust me, you don't want to come up here. You just want to stand. Stay right where is she? Where's Amanda? Stand up, Amanda. I promise you tonight that there would be murder. I keep my promises. Now, who's sitting next to you at the moment? So you probably would have been better off back there because I'm not always a good throw. I'm sort of pretty good, but I'm not that accurate. No, actually, guys, Amanda, you won my photograph. Yeah. And I need to tell you that I printed that for me. That was my photo. That was going in my office. <coughs> that was um, a spoon girl out of a colony of about 60, and three years later there were two, and now there's none. Um, for me, it was a really special photo. I actually did love for me to put them off. But this was more important. So, thank you for winning that. <laughs> and you can pick it up after the show. <laughs> so, there's the plug. Now, I promised you murder. You would not believe these are the most vicious birds on earth. And I mean on earth. There'll be a dominant male, which is a little guy up top. Now, kids, please understand. There's going to be something here that you might not want to watch, so it might be best to turn your heads away. And they're not dancing. The male bird is the dominant bird, and the little guy down the bottom thought he could move him on the heron. And this is a fight. This is, these are two little birds that everyone goes, wow, oh, look how beautiful they are. And guys, I tell you the truth, they are fighting to the death. And right there, was the last breath that little bird took. Because that is what nature does. The strongest male has the right to have children. And that obviously means that the line is strong all the way through. That's nature, that's the way it is. You can go out there and when I first saw it, understand I was, I was gutted, I was mortified. Everybody birds kill each other, but that's the way it is for them. They've got enough to deal with out there. They don't need to be dealing with what we're doing to their waterways. Every day they're out there trying to eat. They're trying to catch fish, big fish and little fish and all sorts of fish. And that fish is coming out of our rams are protected 482 wetlands. I can tell you right now, guys, there wouldn't be too many places out there I'd want to eat the fish out of at the moment. I'm being very honest with you. These guys have to because that's how they survive. So we unwittingly are giving them food sources which they don't really want to sing about. That's three birds having a go at all of us. What are we doing? And then they're not singing, they're having a squawk at us. See? They're pretty angry with us. They can't talk. They can't say what needs to be said. Please understand what I'm saying. That is up to us to actually be their voice because they cannot speak. If you spend a bit of time out there, you don't have to go out and do what I do. You don't have to go for a thousand days and a thousand nights and you know, be manic and crazy and all that. You just got to go out there and spend a bit of time. And you will see and hear these little guys begging us to give them, a, give them a break, give them a chance. We can live with them. We can live together in harmony. Um, why can we do that? Because for 40,000 years it's been happening, way before we came along. Harmony. That they're allowed to go from birth to bubs, to have their parents proudly show them off. And I can tell you right now, guys, I'll take you to that spot now, you won't see a swan or a signet. You'll actually see nothing in that water now, really, at all. That was taken in 2008. That's how many years? Six? Six years. There is nothing there now that lives in that water. There's very few birds, there's very few animals. What happens is mum and dad die, and they have to obviously abandon the chicks. And why do they die? Because they get sick. Now this is no different to us. Please understand what I'm saying. That's mum out there feeding the kids. This is, this is me feeding the children. You know what I mean? It's our job. We've got to look after our kids. We've got to give them a good place, a good home. And we'll come to this in just a minute. Pip, you've seen some of the most beautiful and some of the saddest things out there. Stare 
from big yellow ringed eyes, ungainly beaks ready to trawl. Terns hunt from high above, speeding bullet-like, wings folded for a spectacular drive to capture. Ospreys watching the stark silhouette of a dead tree guard a mass of twigs. The haven for chicks, season after season. A lone egret, the marble statue, stands motionless, elegant, before a swift graceful cast on its prey. Cormorants, in black lines, hold wings out to dry. Spoonbills retire to the quiet reaches of the river, perched silently in overhanging trees. Black ducks, flashing turquoise on the wing, float gently among the rushes. Submarine darters move snake-like periscopes through the water. Tan grey wood ducks hurry purposefully to unknown destinations. And dolphins. Dolphins. Surface. Dive. And reappear. Shiny, grey, and endlessly endearing, all in the early morning wakening of the field. I don't know how many birds we've spoken about in that one poem, but I think I lost count of maybe ten. One person that just went out one day and wrote some poetry, ten birds. We have 140 odd species here in Miranda, some of the highest species of birds in the world. Um, little old Nanda, remember that? We, you know, we all sort of forget that you know, we're just little old Nanda. Um, because we had birds that fly all the way from Russia. See that there? They're smaller than that and they weigh half that weight. They weigh 30 grams, that's less than one ounce. A gold ounce is maybe as big as my fingernail. This little bird weighs 30 grams. In the Russian tundra, they all go... And somehow, they find Mandra. They come from Russia to Mandra. They are that knackered when they get here that you'll actually see them just sort of go and land. One cat. If one cat was to walk through within 48 hours of them landing there, the fright and flight, the energy that they need to try and get away from that cat, you'll actually see them just go and they die of heart attack. And one cat can walk through to those 150, 200 birds in one year, one cat, just one cat. You know, I'm not having to go a cat, well I am a little bit. Only if they're let out, I understand what I'm saying. Please understand, I love cats, I hate cats, but you don't leave them to run them up. There's another bird that leaves here. <clears throat> who's done a trip up, who's done a trip to Broome and back? Has anyone managed to do a trip to Broome and back in six days? Leave Mandra, get to Broome, get back in six days. Well, there's another little bird that leaves Mandra and arrives seven days later, 7,800 kilometres in Malaysia. Flies 24 hours a day for seven days, does not eat, does not drink. When it arrives in Malaysia, it's got to have food in Malaysia. Well, of course, Malaysia's not doing the right thing either. And there's very little food for them. These little buggers fly thousands and thousands of miles and they don't, there's no control for them. You have to understand, somewhere it's built into this computer system they've got where they have to do it. They've got no choice. And the day's going to come when they're going to land in one of these spots where they have to refuel. And it's not going to be there. And as simple as that, we can wipe out. Gone. Never to be seen again. Anne-Marie, tell us about... I'll tell you about curly sandpipers that come here from the Arctic on such a night. They arrive like cross-stitch, embroidering the moon. They're 
defend with aching hearts and wings that thread the Hessian salt marsh to pellucid sky. They shed flight's wind-worn rope, its raveled seams, creases which charted paths to sanctuaries like these wetlands, where tiny bodies retrieve their strength, rest their exile's weariness. We are all wayfarers at journey's end, reprieved by patchwork of waters, earth's furthest catchments of spring. Times change. Together we can save their lives. At first light, I will go and watch birds wave, curved bills stitching water, insistently dip-dipping, feeding the hunger to live. The big truth shock hit for me was the day that I went out to this beautiful little place where I've been to a lot of times before. And I saw things that I just could I, I couldn't understand. I couldn't comprehend what was going on. I didn't understand what was going on. When you got little, little um, scrap mould about that big, they were actually jumping out of the water onto the land. Uh, I didn't get my head around that. They were trying as hard as they can to actually, and these guys are this big, guys, two inches. This is a breeding area where the mould come in and breed for the next generation of mould. They couldn't breathe in the water, so they beached themselves. They actually beached themselves on the land to try and get breath. There was thousands, I'm not exaggerating, thousands of dead crabs. Hundreds of blowfish, and you know darn well when there's dead blowfish, something's wrong with the water. Big blowfish, dead. Crabs everywhere, dead. Then the, fish, the birds started to vomit up the fish they were eating. Forgive me for saying that, but it happens. Flies came by the millions. All the crabs you can see down in the bottom here. These are all dead crabs, all through here. These birds gorge themselves. The crows are the smartest. They pick something up that I like. They don't eat. Crow will eat anything. Trust me on that. They'll eat anything you give them, except they wouldn't eat the fish that came out of the water that day. And six or seven days later, we started to find dead birds. Pelican will walk up to you at the foreshore and pinch your box with your chicken in it and your corn and all your paper and eat it. Anyone had that happen before? Yeah, right? Threw them away. Took them out of the water. Do their normal, let's throw them between our beak and get them hit. No way in the world. <laughs> let's spit them out. Never seen a pelican in my life spit out fish. Took that photograph to show you that, you know, it's a big world. And there's the little old man waterways right there. See that one dead fish? Because that's, to me at the time, that was, you know, in my mind, I was seeing that all the fish in the waterways were dying. Um, there'll be people out there that can tell you exactly what all that green stuff, yellow stuff is. Um, and we found dead pelicans. And then I came across two birds that I'd watched and followed for a long, long time. And, and um, one got very sick. About two weeks later, I found him. And Joel was out with me, my son, and he took this photo, which shouldn't have been up here, but I can tell you right now, guys, I was sitting there howling my head off. For three years, I'd follow these birds. I'd seen them raise chicks. I'd seen the chicks fly away, never saw them again, but I followed these birds. It's really funny, it's sort of like, you know, I'm not into reality TV, but I'm maybe into reality birds. <laughs> Um, where you're sneaking a peek into their life and you're starting to understand what they do and what they don't do. And I think you get, you get really wrapped up in it. Um, you get wrapped up in these arguments and these fights and what have you. Um, and to find them dead, because we have probably done something wrong somewhere along the line and it's now affecting the water so badly, it's gut wrench. Now I've included this series of photos here for one particular reason. You can see it low tide there. You can see that one tree. Remember, the, remember what that one tree there looks like. See the low tide there? It's nice and low. It's uh, sun rising, so we're looking obviously to the east. 
taken at a different time, and this is taken at a night time. Water's getting a bit higher. You sort of notice that? Water's a little bit higher. See that tree again? Same tree. Where's the land gone that that tree lived on? That's in Mandra, up in the Serpentine River, and the difference between where the water is now and where the water was before is five and a half feet. I don't think we're meant to have tides that now cover the trees five and a half feet. They were taken three and a half years apart. That's what it looked like when I first saw it. It actually had an island there. That's the same tree. There's the pole. See the pole on the right-hand side just there? That's it there. So it's the same spot. Big difference in the water level. So somewhere along the line, something's happening to our waterways. These used to be fences that belonged to farmers, and they were once paddies. That was a fence line that went into a farmer's paddock. And that is a fence line that once belonged to a farmer's paddock. We start playing with nature. We start making new openings for water to come in and out of, and we start changing how things work. Um, we can totally not be muck it up. Nature will reclaim everything it needs to reclaim once it's got rid of us. And the way we're going, we're actually helping that out to be quicker than longer. I'm serious. Please understand, I'm not saying this to make anyone scared or anything like that. It's just reality that our wetlands are so important to us. And we spoke about, did you know? Did you know the second most important part of a wetland is the filtration system? A wetland not only holds six times more water below the ground than you see above, it is, one of the, it, is, it is the ultimate filtration system to produce pure water, to produce the best water. All that stuff that's built up over the years, the water filters through it and comes out the bottom as a purer form of water. So as our drinking water gets worse and worse because we deplete our wetlands, and that's probably the reason why. Has anyone ever heard of the champagne water? The best water in the world, and they call it the champagne of water. Do you know where the best water in the world that comes out of a tap comes from? New York. I guarantee none of you would have thought of that. They call it the champagne of water. Do you know where New York's water supply comes from? 160 miles away, they've got 16 natural lakes. Just about 25 years ago, they had to build a filtration system because they're system wasn't working too well and it cost $3.5 billion and it cost $300 million a year to run it. Some bright spark said, why don't we let nature do its job and why don't we buy all the land around the lakes, do deals with all the farmers and turn them back into natural wetlands. Running costs, zero. Cost them $1 billion to do that instead of $3.5 billion. For the last 35 years, they've been bringing the best water in the world. It has come from a natural filtration system. Please understand, New York water is not filtered at all. They put nothing in and take nothing out of it. You turn the tap on, it comes straight from the system from the river, the way it's done, after it's gone through nature's incredible filtration system. Governments are now starting to realise that they have made a blunder by taking all our wetlands away because it is also an incredible filtration system. The third part of Did You Know? It's also one of the best storage systems in the world for carbon. And carbon at the moment is a big thing on everyone's mind. Wetlands hold twice to six times as much carbon as what all the trees do. Big difference is if I cut a tree down, if I take this little tree here and were to cut it, the carbon that's in that tree pretty much stays there. The minute I drain a wetland, the carbon in the wetland becomes carbon monoxide. That's the stuff that kills us. That goes up into the air, back into the atmosphere. This man of the United Nations said that it is highly possible at the moment that all the wetlands we're depleting is putting nearly 50, uh, sorry, 50% as much carbon monoxide into the air as all the cars put together. So at the rate we're depleting, we are putting in half as much as what all the cars are in carbon monoxide. So there's, there's a third reason why it affects us as people. We forget the birds. Remember, they're gone now. We've shot them all. They're, they're all dead because there's none to eat. So it's just up to us. So it's an incredible flood barrier. It's a filtration system, and it stores carbon. Now let's put the birds back in because I think, you know, the birds are also... <coughs> protest image I did, there were 63 spoonbills there three and a half years ago, all breeding, having an absolute hoop. I can take you back there now, I doubt very much there's, you'll find one, you won't see one at all. They're just about all gone. There's nothing in the water they can eat now, it's rancid. 
It's all five acre blocks all around here now, little, little farm blocks all around there, around this area here. Um, it's not anyone's fault. You know, they buy, people buy the land fertiliser, people buy the land to do this because they're allowed to. So it's up to us to ask our, our, you know, our powers, our politicians, the people who make our laws, why? Why is it allowed? Why can they actually do that to something that is very important to us and very important to the animals and the wildlife? Why? Well, why can't we? Why does anyone need to live 20 feet away from the water? I'll guarantee if you ask any of the mob that come out here, when they used to wander around this countryside, how close to the water did they camp? And I'll leave that up to you. Find, find George or Harry and ask them tonight, how close did they camp to the water's edge? And they didn't go anywhere near it. But we seem to want to be always on the water. Remember, whatever they did was, what effect would it have for 20 generations ahead? Not what it will do till tomorrow. Or is this a fix for tomorrow? Um, I've got to throw this in, and, we're, and I'm going to be a little bit over time here, um, but you're just going to have to bear with me. And this is mainly for the fact that, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Well, it is, but, you know, there is hope. Um, and there is a bit of humour out there, guys, I've got to tell you. So, <clears throat> a lot of you have seen these before, and, you know, but I'm, you know, it's a bit funny. But when I was out there, I actually noticed that birds pooed. But I never ever saw a photo. I never saw a photographer that took birds pooing. So in my little walk, sense of humour in my mind, I went out for about three or four months and tried to catch a bird's poo. This is when I learned something very, very vital when it comes to watching birds and animals and what have you. They will tell you what they're about to do before they do it. Just like a poker player. 99% of the poker, you know exactly whether they're bluffing or not because they've got a twitch or whatever. These birds are exactly the same. Each one of them, each species will do something and then two seconds later it poops which means I know it's going to happen, so I'm there ready to go. These are called tripods. I've never seen a bird with three legs before, but as you can see now, it's got three legs. And now it hasn't. And it's got three legs. And one really, really, really big problem. And they all seem to want to do it when they're sort of facing me with their bottoms. So what's that telling you as well? Dave, nick off. That is an osprey, ladies and gentlemen. And yes, that is, it's called the sign rider. And as you can see there, that is one massive big get out of the way. Birds poo. And poo. And poo. And poo. You know me, I can talk for the next six hours. <laughs> I can talk forever. There are obviously time constraints. I haven't said everything I need to say. Um, tonight was about having more than me and more than my photos up here. Um, you know, I've been pretty blessed in the last year or so where the limelight's been thrown on Dave. Um, and I can tell you now, four or five years ago, you would not want to know me now. Um, things are different for me. Um, and I realise that I've been given an opportunity to be able to get out and speak and to make it known to people that there are problems and we have to do something about it. I was incredibly blessed when I, we spoke about doing this again. And um, Thelma and Michelle and that said, you know, why don't we talk to the Aboriginal people and see if the mob will come down and help us out. Um, we have Pip and we have Anne-Marie, the, the, the poetry for me is just, I hate poetry. You have to understand I don't like to read, and the last thing I like to read is poetry. Um, when Pip gave me a poems first, and when I first saw Amory's poems, I was bored. I had like a kid. I'd never heard anything so moving and beautiful. Now, maybe it's because I spent so much time out there, I could understand. I could, I could see in their words, because I'd seen them. In a lot of cases, we found photographs that we could just go snap straight to it, and it worked in beautifully, you know what I mean? So it, it was like everything was interconnected. Um, the mob came down, the singers came down, and tonight we've taken on a tiny little journey. Um, and we haven't spoken anywhere near as much as we need to, but understand I'm going to continue on speaking. We wanted you to get a little bit of a taste that if we do not, as a collective, as a group of people, if we do not get together and make a stand, nothing will change. And, I, and please, guys, I understand. Um, I, and I call it the ostrich with the head in the sand. It's not my problem. It's government's problem. It's Shire's problem. Someone else's problem. Who cares? 
But if you love the place you live in, if you respect the place you live in, if you enjoy living in a place, you've got to actually make a stand. You've got to take some form of ownership for what's going on. You might not have created it. No one's blaming anyone here for doing it. Um, and a lot of us are too old in our ways to really change and, and make a difference. Um, it's more our children, our children's children. But unfortunately in this case, there's not going to be time for that. We need to be doing something now and doing it really quickly. I know there's, um, and I think I'm allowed to say this, is, is that our wetlands very soon are going to be upgraded from being lousy to critical. Now this is a Ramsar protected wetland. should never have got the critical. should be no way in the world that that wetland, that waterway, was allowed to get the critical, but it's going to be upgraded to critical. Critical means we're going to struggle to get it back. Everyone's known about the problem for a long time. I've got, I don't know how many, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of PDF files on all the meetings they've had for Ramsar as to how they're going to introduce it. If they, if they took all the money for all the meetings they had, they would have fixed half the bloody wetlands we've got here. They've spent millions having feeding saying there's a problem, um, millions saying how are we going to enforce it, and no one's enforced it. Um, it's our job to actually make people see that if we don't, and guys, it's not just our wetland, we're talking the whole world. But we can't sort that out. It's too, it's too big for us to even consider that. So let's look after ours. This is ours. It belongs to us. It doesn't belong to the government or the shire. And I'm sorry, shire, if you think you own it, you don't. We do. We're the people own it. The people of Australia own it. The mob there own it. It belongs to all of us. But that means we have to own the problem as well. So we've got to be part of standing up, sending letters in. We've got to be part of saying no. And we've got to be part of saying it's got to be fixed. Um, one person can make a difference, and together, as a collective, as a group of people, we can really and truly make a difference. We can. I say to people, even if you just pick one little bit of rubbish up that you see that's going to float into the waterways, that's making a difference. I had an old lady last time we did, lovely old dear, can't remember her name now. I called her Doris, and it might not have been Doris. What can I do? I said, I bet you make the best scones in the world. She said, oh, yeah, I do. I said, well, next time the guys do something, why don't you bring down a plate of scones? That's the difference she could make to, to help understand. So each one of us can. Every one of us could do something to help in a small way. I don't know if you know, but if I got a grain of sand dropped it on the ground, got a second grain of sand, just kept going, sooner or later I have a mountain. Just by one grain of sand at a time. Might take me a while, but I'll get there. I can build a mountain. Just grain of sand. So one person can make a difference because one tells one, tells two, tells four, tells eight. It's pretty much the way it works. Doubles up every time. Um, because this is ours, this belongs to us. This is our Mandra wetlands. This is our Ramsar 482. Um, I know that not everyone can get involved in helping, um, but I guarantee just a letter. Just write an email to Mr. Greg Hunt, Minister for the Environment. Um, I'll have his email address on my website tomorrow, or I'll give it to you right now. I've just about memorised it. No, you actually go on and you can get it free of charge. They don't charge for his, web, for his email address and you can legally email him. You will not get arrested for it. And just say to him, hey, what's going on? Ramsar 482. Guarantee, you know, he might be the Minister for the Environment or guarantee 99% of the stuff he wouldn't have a clue what's going on. He's just doing what he's told. You know, he's got his advice. We've got to tell him, guys, we have to make a stand. We've got to get up and say enough is enough. Pip, is enough enough? <coughs> Vanishing wetlands. Our species has it in its bones, built in from eons past. The long flight every summer across lands and oceans vast. From nesting in Siberia to summer's global flight, a strength and inner guidance will sustain us. Day and night. Through countless generations, the natural, strong, deep core bids time to travel, feed, and fly, with seasons guiding all. This planet offers feeding grounds we know from winging high, looking down on nature's wondrous gifts, too great to question why. Our breeding grounds are far from where we feed in nature's plan. It's a very fragile balance being overwhelmed by 
by man. Our journey is exhausting. There's a need to build up strength to maintain, maintain the source of energy on flights of such great length. Environmental changes to the waterways abound. If time to think what makes life cycles keep on turning round. Through habitat destruction, nature's heritage cannot wait. Act now to save our wetlands before it is too late. tread kindly here, and gentle as ground water trickles between thrombolites, after seeping through sedge and samphire, look, even the trees spread weightless branches on this lake, and lie like perfect offerings to the clear light they came from. And if sound is the last sense to leave me, let it be like this evening, when seams of sky were opened by calm light and loose threads of black swans flew closer, wings low on the lake. Coming home from the south, they passed me with their necks outstretched like long stitches dusk falls to the far shore where they became needle point in the deepening distance above dunes, darkening the sky's torn hem invisibly mending the dark. Let my leaving be like that interval before stars arrive, a seamless world, all things lost from sight, only the swans cried for guidance, calling a flyway through the night. Says there's save the Kiriri wetlands. I think we did a bad job of that. The other one over there says <coughs> Point Grey. I oh, should did a bad job of that too. There is hope though, ladies and gentlemen. The damage that's um, been done can be reversed to a point, I understand. We'll never have the wetlands and the waterways back the way they were. Released two weeks ago in Scotland by the Water Authority in Scotland, 160,000 houses and 13,000 businesses are now in direct fire of flooding. You know what Scotland are going to do? It's the only thing they can do. They're negotiating to buy back all the land they turn into land for farmers and revert it back to the natural wetlands that were there because they've realised that they are the best line of defence. In America, they put a figure of $44 billion, billion dollars, on what the wetlands do and save the American government. $40 billion saves them. Countries in the world that don't have a lot, the wetlands to them are gold because they can't afford to have filtration systems. They can't afford to put levees up to stop flooding. So they actually revere them and, and respect them. Um, you can go onto any wetlands website anywhere in the world at the moment. I'm serious, there's millions of them out there you can find where they're all saying that the cheapest way, the <laughs> actual cheapest way to get everything back with our river systems that is actually buy back the land that we turn into farmland and revert it back to wetlands. It doesn't seem to work though as well if we use land that originally wasn't wetland, so they do make wetlands up, you know, they create them. Um, but they're, um, for some known reason, they don't work anywhere near as productive or as well as the natural ones. We've got one of the most beautiful, one of the most unique, and according to so many people that seem to know, um, one of the most fragile and important wetlands in the world. So it rounds off away too. Um, why don't we treat it with the respect that it deserves? 
Why don't we just sort out? Because I ask everyone here tomorrow morning, next morning, whatever, go, go get coffee, deck chair, go watch the sunrise. I know it's 4.30 in the morning. What a bugger, eh? You've got to get up at 4.30 in the morning. I'll guarantee you, you sit out there for an hour, you'll gain four minutes on life. Do the maths. You will sit out there, your heart rate will just... You will breathe again. Because we live in such a fast-paced world where everything's go, 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 go. That we don't slow down anymore and smell the rain. Go buy a coffee, cup of tea, and go sit out there and watch the sunrise. I guarantee you, that day, it'll be the best day you've had in the last 20 years. It is amazing. And you can feel the clock going <coughs> backwards. It's about the only time I've ever felt the clock going backwards. It's a tonic. Um, and I can talk to you about, not only is it a tonic, there are places out there that technically are tonics. There's places you can go to that are technically amazing tonics. Um, in, that, in this area that we've got. Um, so I just want you to just think about maybe 4.30 tomorrow morning. Why don't you get coffee and a dick chip and go watch the sunrise? A challenger.